really amazing for me to be here. I've been having a fabulous weekend meeting all of you and spending time with all of you. And today I want to share a little bit about my journey for the past six and a half years. Not so much about the organization that I started, but about my relationship with it and how it's changed dramatically, especially over the past year. So as Yarrow mentioned, six and a half years ago, I started Back on My Feet, which is an organization that has given me more purpose and meaning and clarity in my life than I ever, ever could have dreamed of or asked for. And when I was 26 years old, I was living in Philadelphia, and I had spent the past two years really looking for meaning, looking for something to make my life make sense. One thing was for certain, and that was I was a runner. Running made me feel so strong, and I had a very special relationship with that sport because I became a runner when I was 16 years old to deal with a lot of the garbage that was happening at my home when I was a kid. My dad was my hero, my best friend, my biggest fan. He would literally drive four hours to watch me play a game of basketball, and it was so not worth it. He was always rooting for me, and he was like, you know, the guy who hung the moon. And when I was 16 years old, I discovered my dad was a gambling addict, and it completely destroyed my perception of him. Uh, my mom kicked him out of the house, and unfortunately, I spent the next three years resenting my mom, having a really tough relationship with her, and also trying to fix my dad. So the next 10 years in my life, running was really important to me. It, again, gave me strength, gave me identity. It was my best friend and it was my enemy, but it was like something I had to do every single day. And fast forward back to 26 years old in Philly, and in May of 2007, I'm running by this homeless shelter that is literally a half a mile away from my apartment. I had walked by this homeless shelter hundreds of times before, and I never gave a shit about any of these guys that I saw. I, I walked on the other side of the street with my headphones in. And in May, these guys started to wave at me, and I started to wave back. And pretty soon, we had this really fun, quick-witted rapport happening for 10 seconds each morning as I would run by them. And soon I realized I was cheating them. Why do I get to be the runner, and they have to be the guys who are homeless on the corner? Why can't we all be runners? So I decided to start a running club. And I called up the director of the shelter and told him I'd like to start a running club for people living in it. And he tries to think of the nicest way to tell me that homeless people don't run. And I fortunately convinced him to at least ask the people living there, and he did. And nine guys said yes. I go up to the shelter at the end of June with shoes and clothes for these guys. And the most important thing I did was made them sign a piece of paper. It was called the dedication contract. And this piece of paper said, if you want to join our running club, which was all it was ever supposed to be, you've got to show up three days a week at 6 a.m. You've got to be on time, and you've got to support and respect your teammates. I didn't look at these group of guys and say, you know, I know you guys are homeless, so you're probably not going to make it three days a week, but if you can make it one or two, that would be great. And you're definitely not going to be on time, right? Like, you're homeless. But if you can try not to be too late, I would appreciate that. Here I looked at these guys with absolute perfection. I, I saw perfection in them and thought that they were capable of that. And it's almost as if they looked at me and were waiting for someone to look at them with such purity. And we all ran our first mile on July 3rd of 2007. And some of us walked it, some of us crawled it, some of us ran it, but we got our mile in. And pretty soon people started to hear about the organization and it starts to, or the running club, and it starts to grow. And we got 20 people running each morning. And over the next couple of weeks, I realized something really special, that this was not just a running club, that this was a catalyst to change people's lives. And there were two observations that made that obvious for me. One was that these guys were showing up, and they were showing up every single day and that they were on time. You know, I learned through my dad the hard way that you can't force anybody to do something because you want them to, especially a grown man. And the second one was the reaction I would get when tracking their miles on this big poster board with the, their names on the left and the numbers at the top. These guys would hover behind my shoulders and watch me give them credit for the work that they did with a huge smile on their face, and that's when I knew how much in common I had with these guys. Everybody in this room wants the same thing that, that I do. We all want to be noticed, appreciated, valued, cared for, loved for, cheered for, and rooted for. And that's exactly what these guys wanted, and they were getting that out of this community. So this question starts to form that, what if we can actually change the direction of their life by changing the way they see themselves? If we can change how they see themselves into somebody who is a runner, a teammate, a friend, reliable, responsible, a goal setter, an athlete, Instead of somebody who's homeless, which has a horrible stigma to it, somebody who's undeserving or not capable, 
are they going to be able to have a happier and a better life? Well, this vision is all that I can think about. On top of this idea to grow this and build it into something to help beyond these nine guys, what about all the other shelters in Philadelphia and all the other shelters in the whole wide world? My personal life is starting to make sense. You know, nothing good came from my dad's addiction. It was tears and heartache and resentment and frustration and hatred, and nothing good came from it. And it was only now that all of those struggles, it was, if it wasn't for my dad and his, and his life and his hardship, I would never have given a damn about those guys. When your life starts to make sense like that, you start to pay attention. So I asked myself three questions. What if, what if I you know, keep giving what I can when I can and continue on with my life? Is that going to be enough for me? What if I decide to build this into an organization and I give it everything I got and everybody quits and now I'm left with this really bruised ego? But the third one was, what if it works? What if it actually works that we can change the direction of people's lives by changing their identity? The answer seemed really simple to me because I was okay with the worst case scenario. So I surrounded myself with people who were much smarter than me and we started building and growing and learning and listening and screwing up a ton, fixing those mistakes and then screwing up some more. And as Yara said today, it's a six and a half million dollar organization with 48 staff that's helped thousands of people and I'm really proud of that. But a year and a half ago, I started to ask myself another question. I started to feel like I was having another one of these moments where uh, this wasn't enough for me anymore. And I thought, that can't be right. I found my purpose. I found my mission. I'm helping people every day. I get to work and help people. Something weird's going on. I just need to actually keep building and creating and doing more for back on my feet, and then this feeling will go away. So that's what I did. I started building more, launching new cities, making more projects within the organization, and the feeling didn't go away. And I started to feel like, do I, do I have another mission? And is that selfish of me? How can I give this life that I have, it's so beautiful, I'm taking my pain and helping others, and who am I to say that that's not good enough? And then I started to look at the organization, and I realized what I had do, been doing to it. Whenever I felt like I wasn't enough, or that I wasn't doing enough, or I was dissatisfied, I kept building and growing and creating, because that's what I know how to do, and I know how to do it really well. But some of my people started to quit. And everybody kept telling me, Ann, this is too much work, we can't keep up, we're getting really burnt out. You'll be fine, just keep going, look what we're doing, we're building this amazing thing, you can't build an organization and make shit happen nine to five, let's go. Then a couple more people quit. And then I realized, maybe the problem is me. No, 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 it can't be me. I'm the founder of this organization. This is my mission and my vision. It can't be me. But then more conversations started to happen and I started to really think about what I was doing to the organization and I was being so damn selfish. And it was my ego that was actually turning into the CEO where I was satisfying everything that I knew how to do and I was getting all these accolades and every, all these awards and oh my God, isn't that amazing? And the organization. And I was fueling that but I was hurting the organization. So four months ago, I decided that it was time for me to step down, which was a really, I actually haven't cried about this yet. I'm such an ugly crier, shit. <laughs> But I, um, I called my board chair and I said, you know, it's, it's time for, for me to move on. All this succession planning that we've been doing that I thought was just bullshit and I thought that's just what organizations do, you know, it, it has to become real because I'm not helping anything. What the organization actually needed was sustainability and stability. And I have no idea how to do that. I don't know how to maintain things. And, you know, I needed to step aside and let the organization actually become what it was going to become in a sustainable fashion. And I also realized that I needed to grow again. 
I needed personal growth and professional growth, and I actually had to go build and create something else to satisfy what makes me happy. And it's so interesting when I tell people, God damn it. You know, I wanted to do something completely different, something that was a little bit less emotional for me. For any founders and CEOs in here, you know that when you build and create something, it's like your baby. And to admit and be like, I'm not the right person to continue to raise my kid is really difficult to do. So for me, in my life, I knew I needed something a little bit less emotional, but still something I was passionate about. So I'm starting a new business in the for-profit industry with health and fitness. And when I would tell people that, they'd be like, oh, what are you doing after back on my feet? You must be moving to Africa to save young children. <laughs> and I'd say, no, I'm starting a for-profit company. I could just feel the disappointment in people's faces. And I would find myself being like, oh, but I'm still really heavily involved with back on my feet. Oh, and I'm going to do this and this and this to satisfy their impression or expectation of me. And now I've stopped doing that. I'm starting a for-profit business that I'm really excited about. I'm not embarrassed about it. I don't feel like I'm a bad person for it. And I'm building myself a new identity with new challenges, with new expectations. I have no idea how to do half of it, but I'm going to figure it out. And I like to think that when the next CEO of Back on My Feet comes in, that I'm going to continue to handle things with poise and character, but I might have some mental breakdown. And I've said that out loud to people to say, I'm going to try the best I can, but this might happen. And so my message for all of you is that whenever we do things that are amazing and we think our life is full and complete, there's going to be a moment where you're going to want something else and you're going to want to do something else. My friend Nancy actually told me that, you know, life is all about moments. That's all that we have are moments. And so why not try to make more happier moments than not and keep building and growing and creating and never get complacent with our creations and never put yourself first and remember the mission that you started to do something in the first place because that's what has to become before yourself. And I learned that a little bit of the hard way. Thank you. <laughs>